Man, I say, Lord, thank you. May that be true, because that's really what we're after is uh, the presence of God, the Word of God, the sense of God, what God says to us, what He's doing in our life, what He's moving and motivating in our life, and there's no better place than here together, experiencing together the Spirit of God speaking to our lives. As believers, we're called together as a body of Christ. I mean, there is a reason why God calls us together. He said, because we're all gifted in certain ways. We all have certain abilities. We all, Romans, the book of Romans says that we all have certain things that we do well. And all of us have certain things that we do well. And when we have these things, our responsibility is to do them. And when we do them, we form a body. And you can think about your own body. Yeah, I mean, just exactly like your body. You know, the, these fingers are not arms, but they are fingers. And arms are wonderful, and without an arm, you can't reach. But without fingers, you can't grasp. So we need both the arm and the finger, and we need the elbow, and we, we need these tendons and all. Of, so every part of our body is important, and and it all functions together. So when God calls us together, he calls the whole body together so that we can be effective in doing what he's called us to do. Now, there's one book in your Bible specifically, I, I think, that is uh, specifically instructive to the body, a book written to a church somewhere. Uh, what church? We, we really don't know. Written by James, the half-brother of Jesus. We've been studying this. There are about four Jameses in your Bible, and just for lack of uh, uh, trying to miss all of that, if you go back to the first message, you, I, I'm sure I went through all of that. But, um, but it, it most likely, I mean, vastly, vastly, uh, the confidence is this book was actually written by the half-brother of Jesus, James. Uh, how many of you know that, Jesus, that the Virgin Mary did not stay a virgin all of her life? You do know this, right? All right, yeah, that Jesus had brothers and sisters, that once Jesus was born, he was the first, and she and Joseph hadn't been together, but the Holy Spirit uh, placed the child in the womb and said, this name shall be called Jesus, and he shall save his people from their sins, and Jesus was born, but then Mary and Joseph lived a normal adult family life with other children that were born and sisters and brothers. They're mixed throughout the whole New Testament. You hear conversations between them about Jesus. Uh, they're speculating about the fact that he might be, you know, a little mentally off and other things, and we need to go in and get him out of there because he's about to be killed by these people that he's telling that he's the Messiah. And, you know, I mean, uh, you can imagine... You can imagine the quandary that a family that had Jesus as a brother would be in, right? I mean, they grew up with him. They played games. They would hide and seek. I'm sure Jesus always won. Uh, you know, they marbles and hopscotch and whatever it might be. <laughs> I want Jesus on my team. Yeah, we always win. And, uh, and so, you know, they're in this quandary and... and and, and James was not a believer. He, was, he did not, I mean, imagine how difficult it would be to believe that this guy that you grew up with that got the ketchup every night before you got it could possibly be the, the Messiah of the world, that he could really be who he's now saying. Because Jesus lived a normal childhood, according to the Bible. There's really no record of what actually he did. The verse just says that he went home with Mary and Joseph and he submitted himself to them. And he grew in stature and wisdom, which means he just grew in size, like a, from a boy to a man. And, and he grew in wisdom, like uh, from a childish, immature boy to a mature, grown man. And that's all we know about him. But So th there's nothing significant obviously that the Holy Spirit feels that we need to know about all of that or else it would be in the Word of God. You know, it would be some information about that, some instructions. And I just want you to know uh, that as we read the book of James, and you know this, we're reading from someone who is like you and me, someone who has lived with doubt in their life, that have lived with uh, prove it to me in their life, who've made bad mistakes, who went the opposite direction and 
And James only came to Jesus when Jesus himself appeared to James after the resurrection. And the Bible says clearly that he appeared unto James. Specifically, he went to James and he appeared to James and he and he showed James his resurrected body. And from that point, James became a believer that he was actually who he said he was. And James evidently was a tremendous man of value and dedication, and he was wise, and he was trusted because within a very, very short time, James is, is promoted by the apostles, the disciples, the Peters, and the, and, the, and the James of the disciple group, and John, his brother, and, uh, and Philip, and Nathaniel, and Bartholomew, and all of those guys, the, the 12 disciples of, G, well, the 11, counting Peter, I mean, Judas was gone, but, but they, all, they all had to say amen to James being given a position of authority. Now, this is, this is before the gospel were written. This is before any of the letters of Paul. This was before Paul even got saved. I mean, this is the birth, the infancy of the church like we're in right now. I mean, it, it, it was when nothing existed like this at all, and these decisions were having to be made, led by the Spirit of God, about what this would mean for the future of all of us and all the Gentiles and everybody else because at the particular time of the book of James, there, there, there either were no Gentile Christians or there were so few it would be, be uh, barely worth a mention because James was written as one of the first books of, of the New Testament. I know it doesn't appear there in the order. I'm, I, uh, let me say this for our young people, all right, because they don't really know this probably. There used to be a, a book, and this book, what a book is, is a book is an, a collection. A collect, I, know, I know this is antiquity for, for our young people. They don't really know this. They've probably just seen it on TV and stuff. But, but there, there's a, it has a cover on front and a cover on back, and it has these pages in, the, in, the, in it. And on these pages, it has writing. Like when you look at your phone, uh, instead of words being printed on a screen, they were printed on pieces of paper. And, and what paper is, is paper is a... Um, <laughs> Uh, well, you know, for those of us that grew up looking at a Bible, you know, you know how it was. I would be up here, and you would have your Bible in your laps, and I would say, we're turned to book so-and-so, turn to James. This morning, turn to the book of James. And then I would already have it marked in my Bible, so I would be Johnny on the spot, boom, it would be open, and I would be ready to read the book of James, and you guys would be out there flipping your pages trying to find the book of James because it's in an obscure place. It's not like Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, or Acts, which are right at the front of the New Testament. And you can kind of, if you, if you just open your Bible up, you probably can turn to one of those. You know, or Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, which uh, one of those you seem to open up to pretty easy. But then you don't know, well, he, he said Philippians. Do I go back or forward? I'm, I'm in Colossians. And, and so... Uh, you know, you, you develop strategies, you know, about uh, uh, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and, 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 and um, whatever else. Um. <laughs> Galatians, Galatians. I had to think of it myself. But anyway, the point being that, you know, if you didn't know, you had to look at the table of contents. No, I tell you what most people did. You know what most people did? They didn't want people to know that they didn't know enough about the Bible that they didn't know where the book of James was. They wanted to appear spiritual. You know, if, you get, if they see you looking in the table of contents, or if they see you struggling and you're sitting here going, you know, trying to find it, then everybody knows you're not much of a Christian because you don't read your Bible because you don't know where the book of James is. And so to avoid that, here's what you do. You, just, you look next at your neighbor who's in James, and you turn the number of pages that you think the, the thickness of this looks like it's right and the thickness of that, and then you bring your, your Bible up and you hold it, keep your cards held in close so nobody can really see that you're really not in the book of James. You know, you're in Hebrews. If you'll go one more to the right, you'll be there, but you don't know that. 
you know, and so you, you, you know, you, you're in Corinthians, you know, Second Corinthians. You know, it looks right, but it, you, you know, we're, you're not at James. But, but I, I say all that to say to you that the way our Word of God is put together is, is amazing, really. And, it, and it's, uh, but, but it can be a little bit uh, off-putting because it's not in chronological order. It, it, it's collected together, and it was put together by a committee who translated the Word of God, theologians, hundreds of theologians that read Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic, which some of the Bible's in, and, and they, they translated it, all of them together, and they came to a consensus, and then they presented it, and, and there were no chapter ver- chapters, there were no verses. It was not, there was not something written, chapter 1, verse so-and-so of Isaiah. It was just the scroll of Isaiah with all of it written, and then... And so decisions were made by councils of men and Holy Spirit-led men of God that were called together to, to, to help us create this order so that it would, we could actually look at it together and we could know where we were going and we could all find the same stuff easily and, and so forth. And so the book of James, which is one of the first books in the New, in the New Testament, ends up almost at the end. I mean, about five or six books from the end of the New Testament. So you don't understand, you don't have the rational knowledge by looking at where it's placed, how significant it really is in the kingdom of God. Because you don't realize this was one of the first writings to identify theology and understanding about how, how God works and what God expects. Uh, The first verse says, to the 12 tribes that are scattered abroad. Greetings, James says. The reason he says this is because the 12 tribes are the 12 tribes of Israel. They are scattered everywhere throughout the whole earth. And to everybody else, they're lost. They're called often the lost tribes of Israel. Well, they might be lost to us, but they're not lost to God. God knows right where they are. Just like you may be lost to somebody, you may feel insignificant, you may feel like you don't matter, but God knows right where you are. Look at your neighbor and say, he can find you. <laughs> I'm amused by people that say, I say, how are you? Well, man, I've been running from God. And I'm, I'm thinking to myself, I'm, I'm thinking, running, where are you going to run to? You know, it's kind of like, you're running from God as if somehow he can't run faster than you and, and that somehow he couldn't find you if he's really looking for you, you that you can somewhere hide. Uh, where can you hide from God? The Bible says can't, there's nowhere you can hide from the love of God. Height, death, inside, outside, in the ocean, up in the air, in a house, behind a rock. Uh, you know, you, There's nowhere for you to hide. Believe me, you are not that hard to find. Right. And so the book of James was written to 12 tribes scattered abroad because that, those were the Christians of that day. There were no Gentiles that, you know, I mean, there might be one or two, but there, there were no Gentiles. And everybody look at your neighbor and say, you're a Gentile. Yeah, everybody that's not a Jew is considered a Gentile. So there were no Gentiles. There were only Jews. That tells you how far back this was, that, that it was only Jewish people that had believed in the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and became Christians that this book was written to. And so everybody was a, a former Jewish believer. And James says, let me tell you guys some things about the kingdom of God that you need to know so that you can understand how God works with you and what God wants to know. And James begins to tell them about, let me tell you about sufferings and trials and how to receive these things, that they're really tests from God. And the way you respond in a test uh, shows what's on the inside of you. And so you can say things with your mouth and expect people to believe it, but if your life doesn't match up with what you say, you're a phony, you're a fake, you're a fraud, you're a counterfeit before God. And so look at your own life and say, does my, does my life match my mouth? Because faith saying things without works, working stuff out, is worthless in life, is what James says, that if you have a faith that's strong enough to save your soul, it's strong enough to change your life. 
And so he says stuff like that, and then he, then he goes on and he says, now, I know there's been a question. You know, uh, many people that uh, study the book of James, if you've ever read the book of James, you might have come to the conclusion that the book of James is just a whole bunch of little fragmented thoughts put together by somebody who has trouble chasing rabbits. <laughs> now, we don't know anybody like that. <laughs> We're not... Yeah, you know, we're led by somebody that just goes, follows right down the path always. <laughs> Never chases one of those rabbits. So I know you have a hard time relating to this, but there are um, people that do that. And James says, uh, but, but I'm just saying to you that no, no, no. The book of James is, is, a, is a precise word from God. It's not a bunch of isolated sermon notes just squashed together to make some kind of a book so it can be part of the Word of God. It's a, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a writing led by the Holy Spirit of God through a man who God changed his life miraculously and totally when he received Christ and began to speak to him, as the Bible says, holy men of old wrote as they were led by the Spirit of God. And it is, a, it is a, not a right, strawy little epistle is what Martin Luther, the leader of the Protestant Reformation, said about the book. He was the great theologian that broke away the Lutherans and the Episcopals and the Presbyterians and the Methodists and all that from the Catholic Church, which ruled the world at the time. When Martin Luther read on the steps, the just shall live by faith out of Romans, and he said, I'm living by anything but faith. And then he got 90... 90 reasons, wrote them on a piece of paper, nailed them on the wall of the door and walked away. And a lot of other people walked away with him and said, that's right. We're not living by faith. Let's go. Started a whole nother denomination of Lutherans and Episcopals and Methodists and Presbyterians and, and uh, all of them. And, and, um, and, and, and his opinion of the book of James was, it, he called it, he said, uh, it's a right, strawy little epistle. That's what he said. And the reason he said that is because he didn't understand it. He didn't know what it was talking about. So he evaluated it as a bunch of collection of thoughts that were disconnected and put together. But what I'm telling you is this is the book of James is a tremendous word of God that, that is so, uh, so concise with its theology and its teaching and its instruction that, man, it's a good word for us. It's a, it's, it makes sense. It flows together. And as we've as I've talked through it, I hope that that's come across to you that, that James is just genius, man. I mean, the Holy Spirit is genius just moving us through concepts of things that we all wonder about and we all have to deal with. And this was one of the first, remember, this was one of the first writings ever written to Christians to say, now that you know the Lord, here's some things you need to know and understand, and this is how you need to live your life. And so he starts telling us about trials and sufferings, and he starts telling us how these are tests and how we need to react to these and what we need to do and how we need to look at it. And, and temptation comes from the devil, and everything good comes from God, and understand that. And if you know this, then it's going to carry you through some of these times where where you have problems and you have temptations and you have sufferings. And then he says, now don't get too big for your britches and start trying to judge other people and, 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 and treat them differently. You need to pay attention to how you treat brothers and sisters in Christ and, and don't be hypocrites about honoring some people and dishonoring other people. And then he says, oh, and your tongue. You need to watch how you talk because your tongue is set on fire of hell and it's full of everything. It's a fire. It's a poison. You know, it's a wild animal and no man can tame it. Only God can tame your tongue. And he just talks a whole chapter about how to control your tongue in life. And then we came to chapter four and he said, you know what happens when you won't let God have control of your life? You know what happens when you take control of your own life? What happens is you end up on the outside. You, you become a have-not in life. And then you're a have-not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you don't receive because God's not honoring your request because he knows that you have a heart that only is concerned about itself. And he says, even though you may have a relationship with God, in other words, you may have bowed on your knees and truly said, Lord Jesus, come into my life, save my soul, I surrender, I wave the white flag. And you may truly, legitimately 
come to Christ and have a wonderful relationship with Christ, but all of a sudden things begin to shift in the way you live your life and you begin to live more for yourself, taking on the responsibility of your life and the decisions of your life and the directions of your life. I know nobody in here has ever done that, but you know, let's just say that it can be done, all right? that that can happen to you, well, you don't lose your relationship because your relationship is based on a confession and the blood of Jesus that washes you clean that the Apostle Paul said, I'm persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day, which just simply means I committed my life to the Lord and it's God's responsibility to keep me there until I stand before him one day. And the only way that anything could be lost is if somehow... The, the hand of God could be pried open and you be pried out of the hand of God and taken away from God. Which Romans, Paul says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Height, death, creature, under the ocean, in the ocean, above it, nothing can separate us from God. And so though our fellowship is, is I mean, our relationship is there, our fellowship is messed up. Just like if you have a rebellious family member, which I know none of you have, but, but you know, I mean, it could happen, right? I mean, you understand others, you know, you've probably seen some on TV or something. You've seen, mm, you've seen families that have rebellious family members. These are people that are part of the family, but, they, but they're out of fellowship with everybody else because they're, they're acting crazy. And they're, they're, they're disobedient and unthankful and they, they only care about themselves and they're doing bad things and it's affecting what's going on with the family. And so their fellowship, whenever they walk into the house, everybody else kind of shies back away. Or uh, the mom and dad start hammering because uh, there's so many problems and so forth. And then, and then, you know, there's an argument and a fuss and somebody pouts off and all of that and leaves or does whatever. Well, that's fellowship stuff. And James says, the reason you have fellowship problems with God is because you're selfish and you're self-centered and you think about nothing but yourself and you have taken the control of your own life back. The reason you got saved, the reason you came to Christ was because you said you wanted somebody bigger than you to control your life, to direct your path. And you said, I will listen to you. I will obey you. I will give up my rights and give them, surrender them to you. That's what confessing him as Lord really means. Yeah, yeah. Lord means master. Everybody say master. Master. All right, if he's the master, then you can't be the master anymore because no man can serve two masters, right? That's what the book says because you're going to love one and hate the other and you're, you're going to be drawn to one and then forget about the other, so we know that. You can't have a divided master. You, you either, he's either master or he's not. And whenever you, when you say, I'm going to take over the direction of my life and I'm going to be the master, now you find your fellowship broken with God. You can walk in and say, Dad, and Dad says, come in and I'll forgive, repent, and I'll turn you back. But you're out of fellowship and you sense this and you know this and you, and, and, and you're, you feel alone and isolated and, and rejected and all of that kind of stuff. And, and James says, let me tell you how to get back right. If, you, if this has ever happened to you or if it's happening right now to you, let me tell you how to get back, James says. James says there are eight things that you need to know. You need to know, first of all, and this is not one of the eight, but this is just a general thought, that, that pride is what has done it to you. Pride. That insidious monster of pride. Your own belief that you can handle things. Your belief that, that you're strong enough, you're smart enough, you're capable enough, and you have allowed pride 
to stand between you and God. What is pride? Pride's a lack of submission. Pride is, is a rebellion against authority. And what is the essence of sin? I mean, when you boil sin down to its lowest point, its most common denominator, the Bible says we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. What does it mean to sin? What is sin? Well, sin in its essence is rebellion against God. It is, it, is, it is walking away from God instead of toward God. It is, it is the lack of surrender to God. That's what sin in its, in its essence is. You say, why would God go to hell if I'm a sinner? Because sin means walk away from God. Sin means I do my own thing. Sin means I will not submit and I will not surrender to God. And God ain't telling me what to do. And so James says, it, when you find yourself separated in fellowship because of the things that you are doing or involved in, you can come back. And so in chapter 4, he says, and he says those eight things. He says, well, all right, what do I need to do, God? All right, you need to submit yourself to God. You need to resist the devil and he'll flee from you. You need to clean, you need to draw near to God and he'll draw near to you. You need to cleanse your hands, you sinners. That's dealing with your methods. You need to examine your methods, the way you do things, and, and cleanse your, purify your hearts, you double-minded, which means uh, examine my motives. Why am I doing the things I do? So I submit, then I resist, then I draw near, and God doesn't close the door on his side. He said, you draw near to God. Who takes the impetus? Who, takes the, who, who makes the first move? He said, you draw near to me. I mean, the Bible says that we love God because he first loved us. The only reason we care about God is that God cared about us first. And so God said, I'm going to tell you what, if you will come to me, I will not lock the door on my side. Draw near to me, and then I'll draw near to you, and then cleanse your hand and purify your hearts, your method and, and, and your methods. And then he, and then he says, uh, uh, lament and weep and mourn, and let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy be turned to heaviness. What in the world is that? He's just saying when somebody really gets real with God, life is not a, 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 a joke fest. Life is not a feel-good party. When you really come into the presence of God, God, there's an awesomeness, there's a reverence, there's, a, there's an overwhelming sense of awe that just knocks you down. And you don't, the first thing that happens when you see Jesus is you don't start laughing and jumping and joying. Hey, Jesus, oh, buddy. I mean, no, the first thing that happens to you, same thing that happened to everybody in the Bible when they came into the presence of anything holy, angels, much less Jesus, they fell out. I mean, they had to be awakened from whatever it was. And, and, and hey, get up, buddy. Fear not. That's the first words that had to be said to them every time. Fear not. Why did they have to say that? Because their fear overwhelmed them and just knocked them flat out. And the Bible says when we really see him, then we will see ourselves like we really are are and we're not going to like what we see and so we're not going to be laughing hyenas about what's going on in our life we're going to be sad we're going to weep we're going to mourn we're going to repent we're going to say god how sorry am i how wicked am i so you can tell when the real holy spirit has shown up in your life not because he makes you feel good but because he challenges the lostness of your life James says, that's what you do. You allow the real Holy Spirit to look into your life and you hear what he says. And when you see yourself, you probably won't be happy about what you see. Yeah, and then he says, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And he'll live, God humble me, God humble me. No, that's not God's job. He didn't say, I'm going to humble you. He said, you humble yourself. Why would he say that? Well, the very act of repentance is changing 
your direction. That's what it means. It means I was going this way, and I do whoop, about, face, repent. That's what it means. It doesn't mean I look at what I'm doing and say, I'm sorry, God. And I just keep walking right on him. I say, I'm sorry, God. You're right. I mean, well, that's not repentance. Repentance is an act. Repentance is something you do. Repent means, boom, change direction. That is repent. Now walk the other direction. That's what repentance means. And so he said, you know, you humble yourself. You, you come to me. You, you repent, and then I'm going to change your life. And then he says one, one last little thing here, and this was the newness that we had. And let me just kind of get it over here because I didn't run all through everything. I mean, those are all the stuff we had last week. Let me just get to the last one because you remember I had one left. All right, here it is. Here are the verses, verse 11. This is chapter 4, verse 11, 12. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There's only one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. And who are you to judge another? So he gives four things right in, that, in those two verses that we need to know. That it does matter how we treat each other. Notice what he says first. Do not speak evil of one another, brethren. What is he talking about? Well, he's talking about the fact that, that we are brothers. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. So what does that mean? Well, the apostle Paul in the book of Galatians, which is one of those, you know, <laughs> General Electric Power Company, that's how you remember. I don't know if you know that or not. G-E-P-C, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, General Electric Power Company. So when you turn to Philippians, go G-E-P, uh, Power. All right, General, Galatians is this way, and Ephesians is this way, and Colossians is that way. <laughs> then you can appear spiritual. All right. All right. So anyway, uh, uh, Paul in the book of Galatians says this. He says, do good to all men especially those who are of the household of faith. In other words, Paul said, you know what God wants from us? He wants us to treat everyone with respect. He wants us to be gracious to everyone. That, that we should be, you say, I want to be known for what I am rather than what I'm not. Well, there you go. Uh, that person is an honest person, is a gracious person, is a is a is a non-critical person. That person is uh, is a, is a is somebody I like to talk to. That person is not always walking around looking for something to be bitter and sour and critical about, looking for some way to criticize people all the time and finding something wrong with this thought and that thought and this action and that action. And 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 and, and I'm not saying that there aren't things that are wrong and that we can point out things that are wrong. That's not the impetus of what's being said here. What is being said here is that we do not walk around with this critical heart looking for something to criticize people about. And I'm going to tell you something. If you go to YouTube, you can find videos that will criticize everything that anybody does in life. Every Christian minister is a demon from hell. Every church doesn't teach sound doctrine. I mean, I guarantee you there's probably not a word about me on there because I'm not a big enough shot to be on there. But, but, um, but, if it, but if somebody, I guarantee you, if somebody watched what I preach every Sunday, they would probably say, why, why Pastor Keith is a false prophet? And put a video on inner tube, uh, on inner tube, on YouTube, <laughs> telling you why you shouldn't believe what I say. And they'll, well, well, why? Because their whole life is, let me find something to criticize so that I can be critical. You know what that is? It's really a pride issue. It's like, let me tell you why I'm the greatest and why they are not the greatest. That's what it all boils down to. And it's, and it's a refusal to submit to Christ, which is the essence of sin. 
That is what sin is in its basis. So you don't do this. You don't walk around with a critical attitude. Now, it doesn't mean you never say anything or straighten anything out. It's not, it's not a, a, an instruction to never pay attention to what's happening and correct something. It just says don't walk around with an attitude that everything is wrong and you're, you've been elected to point it all out. And be constantly nitpicking and finding fault with everything around you. It's a bad attitude. It's a bad way of acting, especially in the household of faith. And then the second thing he says is, He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. He said, You're judging the law. If you, if you are walking around critical and criticizing everybody all the time, uh, and th- you then are not keeping the law yourself. And by not keeping the law, you're saying that the law is not good. The law is not right. If you don't keep it, that is a subtle criticism that it doesn't mean anything. So by not keeping it, you are saying this really is not important and this really doesn't mean anything because I'm showing you that it doesn't matter because I don't care whether I obey it or not. So James says when you live like that, you are judging the law. You are saying God doesn't know what he's doing. God made a rule here. God made a law here. And and God doesn't know what he's talking about. And I'm, I'm better suited to know this. You know, everything is, uh, is what is relational. Everything is, I'm looking for a word, but I can't think of it. Um, anyway, relative, relative, yeah. Everything is relative. Did, did you think of that word? I cannot believe that, but you did it. That was the word. Everything's relative. Yeah. It just matters what, what's happening and, and who's happening to it and what is going on. I mean, you know, just choose that. Well, yeah, yeah, so uh, forget the law. And then the third thing, uh, but if you judge the law, you're not a doer of the law, but you're a judge of the law. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Uh, that just simply means that the critic and the criticized both are going to stand before the same judge one day, that there is only one judge. Look at your neighbor and say, and it ain't you. There is only one judge that we will all stand before. And if I criticize Wesley and Wesley criticizes me or whatever it might be, we both are going to stand before that one judge who is not me or him. So it's foolish to pass judgment on somebody else because you're going to stand before the same judge they are. I mean, do you see, do you see the brilliance of what God is saying to the young believers about how to live life and how to be a church and how to walk and and how to live your life and make a difference in this world and be a light. These are the things. Do these kind of things right here. And then he looks at you and says, and who are you to judge? Which is just another short way of saying, uh, let him who has no sin cast the first stone. How about that? Who are you to judge somebody else seeing that you're not perfect either? When you get your wings, then you can start judging somebody else. So until then, don't, don't put your mouth on them. Quit chewing on people. It's not the way God's called you to live because you set yourself up as judge, and you know what that's going to do? It's going to get you back in the same position that you started in at the beginning of chapter 4. It's going to get you asking not, receiving not, and even when you ask, you're not getting anything. And you're going to have to go through all of it again. You're going to have to just go all. And who wants to do that? Man, one time through the suffering wagon is enough for me. Once around the block be in it, right? Man, we don't want to go back again. Who wants to go back through that stuff? But James says you leave God no, 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 no recourse. If you didn't get it the first time, you're going to have to go back. That's not good. And look at your neighbor and say, that's not good. Man, that's not good. And then, and I'm, I am going to say this because I, I don't really want to uh, go into next week, but uh, saying the same thing over. 
But let me just, so let me just read these and then we'll move on to uh, the return of Jesus, which I think you'll, you know, you'd like to see this. Um, these are some, these are what this chapter four ends with these verses and, and chapter five starts with six verses and I'm just going to summarize. Is that okay for you? Okay. All right. Chapter verse 13, come now. This is right after the, who are you that judge? This is just the next verse now. Come now, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make profit, whereas you don't know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. These are the five presumptuous areas of life. You can write them down. They go in those five blanks that are in the right in the middle of your note page. There they are. These are areas that I presume... In other words, I consider them to be under the purview of my thought patterns, my direction. These are things that I don't place before the Lord and ask him to give me direction about. These are things that I presume are going to happen in life. And they're all in that verse 13. He says, because you're going to say, uh, today or tomorrow which is an assumption about the time of your life, you're assuming that there will be a today or tomorrow. Say, so you're saying, I'm going to do this tomorrow. Well, you don't even know if there'll be a tomorrow. Because all through the Bible, the Bible is complete to, by telling you that your life is a vapor. It says you're a mist. You know, Psalm says your life is a vapor. Uh, in another place in Psalm, it says you're like a flower on the hillside that when the sun comes out, you wilt right away. James even said in the first chapter that prosperity is like a flower of the field that looks good until the heat comes up and then it just withers away. And so the Bible completely tells us that we have no control over the times of our life, that only God knows whether they'll be a today or tomorrow. So James is saying, look, if you're a traveling salesman, and, and, I, and I put this on your note, uh, he, they, these verses deal with the working man, with the blue-collar man who's going to go to another city like a traveling salesman and sell his goods and make a living and all that, which is the blue-collar people, which most of us are, people that work for a living and get paid by the hour and blah, blah, blah. We are blue-collar people. And then starting chapter 5, he says, okay, you white-collars, you rich people, you business owners, I got a word for you too. I want you to see how you presume on God. And all he's trying to say here, and this is just the brilliance of God, is that we cannot live our life, we cannot go back to living our life without considering that God is in control of everything. Man, the shelves, the bookshelves are full of books about the future. People that write about the future, the prognosticators and the, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the soothsayers and the astrologers and the people about, let me tell you what's going to happen in the year and all that. Man, they make zillions of dollars because we want to know what the future is like. But James says only God knows what the future is like. And if you're seeking any other way, you're foolish. And you're going to end up back at the start of chapter 4 again because you have assumed that you somehow can control the time in your life. We're going to go to such and such a city, which is traveling, mobility. But you, you do realize when you get in one of these automobiles or you get on a bus or you get on a plane or you ride a bicycle or you walk, certainly if you walk down any road in Gulfport, Mississippi... Because there are no sides of any roads in Gulfport, Mississippi. You walk on the pavement or you walk in a ditch, one, one or the other. And you wobbling on the side of the road trying to keep from getting run over on that little two or three inches you have to go down the road like this, you know. You know that's you walking down. You do know that you have no guarantee of getting where you're going. When you get on that plane, God knows whether the plane's going to make it, but you don't. Um, God knows whether you're going to get to that place you're going or whether you're not going to get to but You don't know. So you can't presume and take the authority of saying, I'm going to go here without thinking if it's God's will, if it's God's purpose. Now, I'm not talking about this cute little refrigerator theology 
where everybody uses the phrase, if it's the will of God, every time they say something. That's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about that every time you open your mouth, you need to say, well, if it's the will of God, I'm going to go here. Or if it's the will of God, I'm going to move there. Or if it's the will of God tomorrow. But no, it, 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 it's not that cute little phrase. It's that that thought is, is the depth inside of you that controls your life, that you know this, that you are controlled by this. Your thoughts are nailed into this. It's not just saying a little phrase. It's actually believing that. And being that, and if you don't believe that, you're going to end up out of fellowship with God all over again, and you're going to go right back through chapter 4 and have to submit and resist and blah, 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 and all of that all over again. So he says, look, and, and location, we're going to go to this or that city. Duration, we're going to stay there a year. You know, That's not your <laughs> decision. That's a God thing. And then success, and we're going to buy and sell and get goods. You know, okay, we're going to be successful. Right? And so all of that is just talking about is the fact that we have to think with God in mind. Indeed, you, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall be able to do this or that. Uh, but now you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and doesn't do it, to him it's sin. In other words... You, you, you must develop a consciousness and awareness that God has complete control of everything in your life. And if you don't do this, then you are going to be sinning against God because you know better. Anybody that knows this and doesn't do it is sinning against God. That's what that's saying. Then he talks to the rich people. I'm, 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 I'm finished. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for your miseries that come upon you. Uh oh, you're gonna have a bad life, you rich people. See, you rich people, rich people have it made, man. I mean, rich people do what they want to do. Rich people uh, live any way they want to live. Rich people are fat, happy, and sassy, and they don't get their cars repossessed, and they don't lose their TVs, and they don't, you know, they can pay their power bill and everything else. And so they have a tendency. If you're rich, you have a tendency to live independent from God, because nobody can tell you anything, because you don't need anything. I mean, I feel sorry for the Britney Spears of life and, uh, and all these professional athletes of life and all these people that make zillions and zillions of dollars because everybody around them is on the payroll. Who's going to tell them that they're doing wrong? I'm not telling them because I don't want to lose my sugar daddy. And if I did tell them, they'd just tell me, get out of here because they don't care about me. Man, unless you have somebody you love and respect and can speak into your life, you get rich, you go down. Now, I mean, you might live fat, happy, and sassy, but that's not the end of everything. And life's not like that. So it, James says, if you live, if you got all the money you need and you live by your own standards, you are going to end up miserable. It's going to be a terrible time. Your riches are corrupted and your garments are moth-eaten. That's not a good description. Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have heaped up treasure in the last days. Uh, man, and your riches and the, the stuff you've stolen from people and the wages that you've held back from your workers, it, it's going to be like a corruption. It's going to be inside of you just eating away at you like a cancer. It's going to be sparking you. It's going to be speaking to you. It's going to be tweaking you. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be punishing you. It's going to be, it's going to be invading you. You know, as you're going to be haunted by this thing of you, you know, it's wrong. They know it's wrong. God knows it's wrong. And it's going to be a miserable life to live. It's what James is saying. James is saying, you, you, can't, you, you can't take your own life back. You've got to stay surrendered to Christ in everything or life or all that stuff you think you've laid up from the future is going to be gone. Look at it, what it says. Indeed, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, cry out, and the cries of the reapers have reached the ears of the Lord of the Sabbath, which means the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. You're in trouble. God's going to fight. Uh, you have lived on earth in pleasure and luxury. You have fattened your hearts as in the day of slaughter. In other words, what he's saying to them there is he's saying just like a just like a calf who has been put in a stall and fed grain doesn't realize that they're not privileged, 
They don't realize the reason they're being fed grain is not because they're privileged, it's because they're going to end up as a main course tonight. You rich people who live like this and think you're in control of things and you think you're fat, happy, and sassy, you're just like a calf that's been put in a stall and fed grain. You think you're special. You think you got it made. You think you're going to live a life of luxury, but you're just being fattened up because you're going to be the slaughter tonight. That's what James is saying. So he's saying, look, man, don't, just because you're rich, don't think you got it made. You have condemned and you have murdered the just and he does not resist you. You know why they don't resist you? Because they can't. You have the power. You have the strength. You have the control. So how can, we, how can we not do all of this? How can we live a life that's not like this? You remember that one little phrase back in chapter 4? I told you a couple of times. Remember this. Remember this. And I know you remember everything I say, so I know this is redundant. But that little phrase in verse 6, it says, But he giveth more grace. Remember that little phrase? You say, how can I live like this? How can I uh, submit? How can I resist? How can I humble? How can I w w keep my motives pure and my, and my mind pure and my heart pure? How can, I, how can I keep from getting too big for my britches? How can I keep from being a critical attitude and taking my, back control of my life and living like I want to live and not even consider God? How can I live like this? But he giveth more grace. The only way you can do it is to be given it by him. The more grace you need, the more he gives. The only time he doesn't give it is when you decide that you're bigger than him and you're full of pride and you won't submit. When you submit, the Bible says he gives more grace. When you don't submit, here's what the Bible says. And James, remember the word? God resists the proud. Resist means fights against, wars against. But when you submit, he gives more grace. We can't do this ourselves, but through him, the greater the difficulty that we face in life, the greater the grace that he gives us to make it through these things. I, I remember an old saying. I, I wrote it down on one of the notes I had. Let me see if I, yeah, here it is. This, I don't even know who said this. I know it wasn't me, but, but I've said it so long, it, you know, I probably think it is, but it's not. It's somebody else. It says this, only one life will soon be passed, and only what's done for Christ will last. That's what James is saying here. Only one life, you have one life, and it will soon be passed. It's a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. It's a, it's a vanishing flower. Only one life, and it will soon be passed. And only what's done for Christ, the motivation of the kingdom, the motivation of surrender, the motivation of he's the boss, and I do what he says, and he controls my life, and I depend on him, and, and, and I can do nothing without Christ. I can do everything with Christ, but I can do nothing without Christ. That attitude, and only what's done for Christ will last. Thank you.